Happy Wine Wednesday. Still using the weird uh, wine glass since I broke mine, but hey, it's got Pinot Grigio in it, so I'm happening and jamming. Hope your week was fantastic. Hope your tanks are doing well. Um, happy Wine Wednesday, y'all. And I've already got Cheryl, Ray, and Holly, and Dan with me. And this, the topic this week, sorry guys, I had too much coffee. I'm like jittery. But the topic this week was um, freshwater dips and formalin. And instead of asking a bunch of questions that would screw up the order of the presentation, I'm going to let Dan take over and we will open it up for open chat to hear how everyone's doing and ask any questions afterwards. But welcome everybody and Dan, I'm making you big. Okay. Well, first of all, um, my apologies. I had planned on putting together a, a nice presentation, but uh, things came up today. So I did this in about an hour and a half. So it may be a little bit of rough around the edges and I don't have as many pictures as I would like to have, but I can still cover the material. And the topic tonight, of course, is freshwater dips and formalin dips and baths. And I'll try to cover this as best as I can. Um, and the part that I'm covering is specifically on seahorses. And you're going to find this is a little bit different um, than we do than some people do with fish. Um, now, a freshwater dip can be used as both a therapeutic tool um, as well as a diagnostic tool with seahorses. Um, as a therapeutic tool, it can help us get rid of the ectoparasites on the body, the oral cavity, as well as in the gills. But yet, as a diagnostic tool, I often like to use it as a means of seeing if there's a parasitic load or not. Because sometimes people will question if there is, we do a freshwater dip, they don't react to it. We know it's not parasites and we move on to something else. And the other way that we use a freshwater dip is as a prophylactic measure. And this can, you know, we'll do this when we have new arrivals that are from wild caught seahorses or suspect sources. Um, and also sometimes if we have a seahorse that has a parasitic load and there's other seahorses in the tank that aren't showing symptoms, we can go ahead and give them a freshwater dip as a prophylactic measure as well. Um, I've been doing freshwater dips for roughly 17 years. And the information I'm gonna give you here, I've never lost a seahorse to a freshwater dip. I have had customers who said they've lost a seahorse to a freshwater dip and my, my thoughts on that is, is that if they lost the seahorse in the freshwater dip, they probably would have lost the seahorse anyway. And the seahorses that I've done dips on have been the, the species you see listed. So I've done quite a few different species. Um, I've done them many, many, many times. And I've, to me, it's a very simple, easy procedure. Now, I do recommend that you do not do freshwater dips on newborn fry. Uh, formalin is a much better alternative. It's not as hard on them. And um, I wait until fry are roughly about a month old before I will consider dipping the seahorses. Um, the reason I like freshwater dips is they're very easy to do. They're quick. They're not, it's a very non-invasive procedure that does not require any medications. And it often uh, produces very quick results. And um, so, if I've got a customer that has, you know, doesn't have a medicine chest all built up and everything, it's very easy for us to put this together and have them do a, a freshwater dip. Um, now, the way that a freshwater dip works is that seahorses are a very complex multi-cell organism. What we're targeting are parasites, which are very uh, simple single cell organisms. And the difference in the osmolarity between the salt water and the fresh water really is what does the trick. The hypotonic environment in the fresh water creates an osmotic imbalance to the protozoans, and this causes water to move into the protozoan to balance it out, which causes them to rupture or burst. Now, some of your more, more larger complex parasites, such as in mesozoans or metazoans uh, classes, may not burst as quickly as the protozoans, but the changes in the osmotic pressure often shocks them, causing them to detach and in many cases perish. And the seahorses being a much larger, more complex organism than any of the others can handle the osmotic change for a much longer time. And they're able to compensate for the changes during the time it takes for a freshwater dip. Now I have seen 
believe it or not, I've had a customer once that called me up and asked me how to do a freshwater dip. I explained it in detail. And the next morning they called me and asked me when they could take the seahorse out of the freshwater dip. They had left the seahorse in overnight in the freshwater. And uh, in the end, the seahorse did fine. Um, and obviously it was pretty clean afterwards. Wow. Um, freshwater dips are indicated when we have new arrivals from suspect sources, whenever you see scratching, um, rapid respirations. Now, when I say rapid respirations, this is constant rasp rapid respirations, not after they just eaten. Um, we also use it for weak snick. Anytime that you see visible organisms on the seahorse, and as we talked before, is a prophylactic measure. Now, when we shouldn't do a freshwater dip is whenever we have open wounds or an obvious bacterial infection. Now, to do a freshwater dip, we're going to need some stuff. So the first thing we need is a container, and it should be a clean container that can hold fresh water and the seahorse and be able to cover the seahorse. It can be virtually any container. It can be a bucket. It can be a large cookie jar from Walmart. It can be a small uh, tank, uh, one of the little hex tanks or a goldfish bowl or anything. I generally like a clear container so I can watch the seahorse, but it does not have to be uh, clear. It can be done in a bucket. Um, we're going to need fresh water. Um, most people will use RO water. You can also use distilled water and then tap water. Some people will use, but make sure that there is no uh, chlorine in it. It's been dechlorinated. Um, then we're going to need uh, fresh water uh, pH test kit and buffer if we want to buffer the water. Now, most people recommend that you buffer the water to equal the tank. In the 17 years I've been doing it, I've never done it. I've always just taken clean water. My thought process is that buffers are salts, and I want the water to have as much of an osmotic difference as it can have. So I just skip adding buffer, just put them in for the time frame and then pull them afterwards and put them back in salt water. Then we're gonna need a thermometer to check the temperature of the water. We want the water the same temperature as the tank, uh, at least within one degree uh, of the tank. And um, I like using infrared thermometers when possible, but a regular thermometer can work just fine. We also need an airline and an air pump. I generally prefer open airlines, but an air stone can be used. Some people will put a hitching post in. I did at one time, and sometimes they would hitch to it, but most of the time they will not. So I generally don't use a hitching post when I'm doing it. And then of course we need some way to uh, time the procedure, uh, whether it's a watch or timer or stopwatch, whatever we wanna use. And then if it's your very first time doing this, it's sometimes good to have a mentor that's available to walk you through the process. I've had many customers that have called me up freaking out over how to do this. And it's very easy to be on the phone with them going over it as it's happening. It gives a sense of relief to them. And then depending, you know, it's an optional thing, but if you have a dissecting scope or something that has high magnification, it's nice to look to see what came off. You'll see a lot of debris. Trying to identify the organisms is tough because most of the time they're all ruptured. Now, when we prepare for the procedure, we want to assemble everything together. We want to take the water, put it in the tank, equalize the temperature. We want to pre-aerate the water because the typically if you're using RO water straight out of the RO or tap water or distilled water, it's been sitting and it's, hy it's hypoxic. We want to aerate it to bring the O2 saturation up. If we're going to buffer, we want to go ahead and add the buffer, get that, that equalized, and then of course get our mentor online. Now, when we actually do the, um, why aren't we working here? When we actually do the procedure, when we dip seahorses, we want to put them in fresh water for a minimum of eight minutes. Now, typically with most, most fish, people do them for very short periods of time of three to five minutes. Seahorses have a different anatomy. They've got a closed operculum. They have a completely different gill structure. And quite often when you're dipping a seahorse, it can be sometimes six, seven minutes into the dip before the, you see them react with the parasitic load. So generally speaking, I go for a minimum of eight minutes. And then if the seahorse reacts during that time frame, I leave them in for 12 minutes. 
And this is counterintuitive because when they react, you know, they, it's uh, kind of a violent reaction sometimes where they start jerking around and whatnot. The parasites are trying to burrow deeper into the flesh to get away from the osmotic pressure difference. And it becomes quite uncomfortable to the seahorse. So um, when I'm doing a dip, the other thing that you'll often see is that when you first put the seahorse in the fresh water, sometimes they'll go down and lay on the bottom. And this is a defense mechanism that they have where they're playing dead. And as long as they're breathing, I leave them in. And eventually they get up and start swimming around. Um, as we're, after we've performed the procedure, if the dip is negative, meaning that the seahorse just kind of hangs out in the tank and watches what goes on and no big deal, after the dip is over, I will then move them back to the tank they came out of or into, you know, if they were in a quarantine tank, back to the quarantine tank. If they came out of the display, I'll put them back in the display. If it's positive, then they really should go into a quarantine or hospital tank for one, for observation, and two, in case there's additional treatment that's needed. And then if there's other seahorses that are in the tank that the seahorse came out of, you may want to consider going ahead and prophylactically dipping them as well. Uh, one thing I recommend is not to do multiple freshwater dips. And when I say that, I mean, don't do multiples in a day, or I generally don't like to do more than one freshwater dip a week. If they require additional treatment, I go to formalin instead. I found that when I did, when I tried doing a freshwater dip each day, I ended up with some um, weird fungal issues. So I really don't recommend doing that. Now, one of the questions that'll come up with some of you guys that are breeding seahorses is how to dip seahorse fry. And this can be a challenge because quite often you have a whole bunch of fry and you don't wanna put some in there and take 10 minutes to get them all collected and put them in the water and then have the first ones already you know, beyond the time frame. So what I used to do was I would take a sieve and I would collect the fry in a sieve and the one you see in the picture is not a small sieve. That's actually a six inch diameter sieve. And uh, I would put them all in a sieve and then I could set the sieve in the, the fresh water and dip them all at one time. Whether I'm doing a fresh water dip or a formalin dip, the same procedure applies. And that's looking at it from above. Um, those guys are about a month old when I did them. Um, whoop, formalin. Um, how do we use it with seahorses? Well, first of all, we're talking medications and I got to put my disclaimer in here that I am not a veterinarian and this is a medication and this is for informational purposes only and all that good stuff. So um, I always have to recommend veterinary advice over anything that I say when it comes to medications. So formalin is nothing more than formaldehyde dissolved in water. Formaldehyde is a gas and when it's in a liquid form, such as in water, we call it formalin. A lot of people interchange the two back and forth, but formalin is nothing more than formaldehyde dissolved in water. At 37% is considered full strength or 1000 milligrams per ml. Um, you'll also see out there 10% buffered formalin or formaldehyde. We don't want to use that for, for treating seahorses. That is a buffered uh, preparation that is used for specimen uh, preservation. And I really do not recommend using that uh, for seahorses. And of course, we want to make sure when we use formalin, we do it in a well-ventilated space. And as far as safety goes, when you're handling formalin, you want to avoid inhalation, ingestion, skin, and eye contact. So it's recommended that you wear gloves when handling, eye protection, and use in a well-ventilated space. Don't put your face directly over the tank once you've added formalin. Um, it smells pretty rough. Um, now, there are people who freak out whenever I mention formalin because a few years ago, the FDA changed the classification from may cause cancer to does cause cancer. And what they, they're, they, they don't want to touch the stuff. But what they, many people don't realize is formalin is used in many of the products we use every day. Um, medically, it's used for excess sweat and foot odor, actually as a topical solution. Uh, it's used in many of the vaccines that we get today have formalin in it. And cosmetics, you know, all your different cosmetics are, have uh, formalin in it. And 
not all of them, but about 20% of the cosmetics out there have formalin in them. And then what a lot of people don't realize is that we actually have formaldehyde or formalin inside of our body. Um, it's required for synthesis of DNA and amino acids. And it's a very, very, very tiny amount, but we actually have it within ourselves. Now, we use, what do we use formalin for? Well, according to the FDA, they've approved it for use of uh, parasiticide for all finfish and, sh and panade shrimp and as a fungicide for eggs of all finfish. With seahorses, we use it as a parasitic side for external parasites, ectoparasites, just like we do with a freshwater dip. Uh, we use it for treating both adults and juvenile seahorses. And I'll, I'm not afraid to use formalin on fry, on your benthic fry, such as erectus. We'll do it on day one on our pelagic fry, such as cuda, uh, reed eye, um, fisher eye, tanneropterus, uh, the, the species that are typically pelagic will wait until they start hitching, which is usually at about two weeks before we'll use it. Now, formalin is used in two different ways. The first one is a short-term bath, which is 45 minutes. It's very similar to a freshwater dip, and the reaction can be much the same as a freshwater dip. And then we have long-term immersion, which is over a period of several days. And uh, long-term immersion is very easy on the seahorse and people that are afraid of doing a freshwater dip or afraid of doing a short-term formalin bath, long-term immersion is very safe on the, and very easy to do on the seahorses. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll do a freshwater dip. If I have a reaction, I'll follow it up with a long-term immersion with formalin. Now to do a short-term bath, it's... Um, one ml of 37% formalin to, wait a minute, that's long-term bath. No, that's right. Short, uh, this should, this should be long-term bath. I got it backwards. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll long-term bath should be one ml of 37% formalin to 10 gallons of water, which is 25 parts per million. Anybody that wants to do the math, I can do that separately. All you have to remember is that when we're doing it long term, we want to do one ml per 10 gallons. We want to repeat it every other day for a total of three treatments or six days. And if we're doing water changes, such as in a tank where we're having no filtration of any means, um, and you're doing a 50% water change each day, then I recommend dosing it each time after the water change. And I go ahead and dose the full one ml. Seahorses handle formalin very, very well. And I've seen them handle up to twice the dose on short term, uh, long term baths with no issue. Now, this should say short term bath. Short term bath is a dip, and that's one ml per one gallon or 250 parts per million. It's done for 45 minutes, and you can expect a reaction very similar to a freshwater dip. Now, the hard part is where to get formalin. And to the, since the FDA changed the the uh, classification from made to does cause cancer, most of the companies that sold the hobbyist um, eliminated selling that because of liability reasons. So to get it now, you can find it on Amazon or you can find it on eBay. And typically what you're gonna find is a bottle that looks something like this called formaldehyde. You gotta make sure that it, it says 37% formaldehyde and often it'll have 15% methanol. Uh, should not have any more than 15%. Generally speaking, you'll find that the methanol content can range anywhere from um, roughly 6 to about 15%. And methanol is used as a preservative for it. There's a little closer shot of the label. And for those of us in the commercial world, we usually buy it uh, products such as the Parasite S. Uh, there's two or three others that are, the brands are FDA approved. Uh, for using with fish and the minimum quantity you can buy of that is typically one gallon containers or 55 gallon drums. So it's much easier to find it on eBay or, or um, uh, Amazon to get it. And with that, I'll answer any questions. You, you caught me off guard. I wasn't ready to unmute. I'm sorry. Okay. I have a question, Dan, about- Go um, home. Sure. Treating fry with formalin. Okay. I would it hurt to do them 
every day instead of every other day? It would depend upon how long you did that. Um, and when I say that, um, if you did it for the typical six days, you're probably going to do fine. Okay. Um, you're going to find that the, the medication has a half-life of roughly um, 24 hours. So at okay. the end of 24 hours, it's about half as strong. So when you dose them again, you now you're bringing up to one and a half times the normal dose recommendation. And um, I've, I have treated seahorses up to two times the normal dose for doing regular um, long-term baths if you will. Okay. I'll tell you kind of why I ask that is because it, it can be kind of difficult for me with the fry because I'm doing a lot of um, water changes just from sucking a little bit of water out and replacing it. So the way I've kind of been using the formalin is if I see it change, I'll use it. Yep. You know, and if I don't, I let them go. So it, sometimes it's not exactly every other day. It might be two days in a row and then I stop. It might be every other day. You know, it just kind of depends. I'm not consistent with it really. I just want, observe and see if they need it or not. Right. What, what do you think of that approach? Well, I'm not afraid to use formalin. You know, we've experimented around using formalin. We've experimented using uh, several other type of antiparasitic products uh, ranging from peppers to uh, peroxide. Uh, I've tried using chloramine tea, which is a basically bleach. Um, and nothing has worked as well as the formalin and is as gentle on them as the formalin is and still be effective. So, you know, in our experiments in severe cases, we've gone to twice the dose. We've gone to dosing daily instead of every other day. Um, for a six day time frame, I'm not afraid of doing it. Uh, long term, I would probably back down a little bit on the dosing. But generally speaking, right. if the formalin doesn't handle it in that time frame, you're probably dealing with something like gill flukes or something else and may need to switch to something like Praziquantel or, you know, uh, could be even something like hydroids where you need Fimbendazole or something like that. So, if, I'm real suspicious if, if after six days the foreman didn't do the trick, I'm real suspicious of it being something else. No, usually for me, it usually works in a day. Like usually when I start out, I'll do every other day, like when yep. the fry are first born. But then after that, I just put it in if I see itching. Right. Because it, I'm taking out some water. So to make up the dose, you know, because like you said, the 24 hours in between. Well, meanwhile, I'm taking water out and adding new water. So I feel like in that case, if I have, if I see itching the day after I gave them the medication, I'll put in another dose after the 24 hours has gone by if I see itching. And right. sometimes I don't. So, so that's okay to do it that way, you think? Yeah, we, we used it, what I, we call PRN in the medical world. And, you know, with erectus fry, we would do it on day one. And after that, anytime we saw scratching, we went ahead and did use the formula. And okay. it, long term, it makes a big difference. I've tried experiments of not using any formula and my numbers dropped. Um, and I've tried it multiple times. And I was very hesitant in the beginning because in FinFish, before they go through metamorphosis, if you use formalin, you can actually make them sterile. And when we first started, I was very afraid of that, but we've long since proven that doesn't happen with seahorses. And of course, they don't go through metamorphosis anyway. Yeah, there was a couple okay, of, thank you. sorry. There was a couple of questions because the, the, in the reefing world, formalin's a big taboo, no-no. And you, you cover very well um, the reasons for that. And you know, just now you just covered why seahorse, with seahorses, it's just different. Um, I have a few questions, but Ray, Cheryl, anything you want to say before I jump in? And I do see the questions in the, in the comments, too. Nothing from you guys? Okay. Um, all right. Dee asked if uh, formalin is better than methylene blue. Methylene blue, how do you pronounce it? Is it an anti-parasite? Uh, yes. Uh, I... I don't use methylene blue at all. There are some good indications for it. And 
I don't have anything bad to say about methylene blue, but at least in the seahorse world, I found formalin to be so effective that it's our go-to. And um, methylene blue will not have the same effect on parasites. If the methylene blue is working, it's probably something other than what we're dealing with with seahorses. And remember with seahorses, you know, there's a couple of parasites that we're dealing with that you usually don't see too much in the reefing community, such as uranema. And uranema, I mean, it's once it takes hold, it's a it's a rough organism to fight. It's a ciliated uh, protozoan, and even hyposalinity does not. They live in a hypo. They can live in a hyposalinic environment. So, formin really helps a lot with keeping that at bay if used in a timely manner, where. Um, we were asking earlier about using the, uh, Holly was asking about using the um, method of once you see scratching to add the formalin that works. And if in a seahorse fry environment, we're talking about seahorse fry, not the large seahorses, and you see scratching and you do not treat them, if you wait too long, they're going to become so infested that you're going to start ending up losing them before very long. Great segue into my next question. If you, and as you were talking, you were talking about if, You've taken the seahorse out. Actually, let's back up. What are the symptoms that tell you that that would indicate to you that a seahorse needed a freshwater dip or formalin? Um, first thing, uh, scratching. Mm -hmm. uh, the second big thing is uh, rapid respirations. Um, those are the two primary things, unless I'm looking at doing it from a prophylactic measure, or if I see something crawling on them that I want to get off of them. <laughs> gotcha. And, and you did say that you're more likely to do prophylactically, I'm going to say it wrong, but uh, with fry, you do use it on fry, right? All the time. I use it on fry. I also, if I, you know, if I'm getting seahorses from Alyssa or another respected breeder to use as broodstock, um, I'm going to quarantine them, but I'm not going to treat them right away or dip them right away. If I'm getting them from a collector, um, they're going into a quarantine tank. I'm going to go ahead and either dip them or formalin dip them uh, just to see if they're clean or not. Um, you know, it's anytime I have a source that I'm suspect on, I go ahead and, as I said before, I, I use it as a diagnostic tool and I can tell if they have a load or not. Absolutely. Um, oh gosh, I, I was trying to message Sam the, the, the link. Sorry, got distracted. Um, so, and with the fry, the reasoning um, that you typically would treat fry is because they're born into the parent tank, into a tank where the ciliates and et cetera might be something that the large seahorses can handle, but the fry cannot. So then you're... That, yeah. that is likely the case. You know, even when, you know, if you take, fr as soon as you start introducing food into the tank, ciliates are going to start populating. Right. And quite often the ciliates can come in with the food uh, they can come from the adult tank. And if you watch the fry, um, if you see scratching at all, if you don't treat it, you're going to have losses. Gotcha. Mermaid's Reef um, Safety Stop is the mix. And I've seen um, Milev's Reef um, recommend that. I, I believe he did a video about that. I'll try to link it when we're done. Okay. Um, next, when, when you, you mentioned that if you've taken the seahorse out, you've seen them itching, rapid breathing, you just decide to do either a um, freshwater dip. And I mentioned in the comments, guys, my first freshwater dip was horrid. I literally had Dan on FaceTime saying, are you sure he's okay? It's so much worse on the human. The seahorse was fine. But <laughs> so you, you do the freshwater dip <laughs> and I'm not kidding, guys. <laughs> it was bad. Okay. You do the freshwater dip or the formalin long or short term bath. And then you mentioned if the seahorse is positive, you may just want to put them in quarantine tank. Uh, because the tank is likely infested or et cetera. So my question is, what do you do about the tank? Does it? Well, first of all, let's back up. Okay, I, sorry. Uh, freshwater dip or a formalin dip would be used to tell me if they had a load. And the reason I want to put them into a quarantine tank is because I want to make sure they're clean before I put them back in the tank. And as far as the tank goes, you know, in the as far as a fry tank goes or in the, in the the world of commercial aquaculture, our systems are bare systems so we can treat the tank with formalin. You can't do that with a display tank. And the only thing that you can do in a display tank is a very large water change. Um, 
you don't want to add formalin to a display tank, especially if there's corals or if there's plants. Formalin is a mild algae side, um, so it can you know wreak havoc on your macros. Um, in high doses, it can wreak havoc on your biological filter. Right. Um, so I don't normally recommend treat, putting formalin in a display tank. What I will do sometimes is recommend treating with a low dose of peroxide after a water change to eat up the organic matter. And that's done typically at you know one or two parts per million. Um, and I have to sit down and do the math to take. When people ask me, I, I calculate out, tell them how much to put in there each time. At that low of a dose, it's not gonna harm anything, including the corals but it will eat up some of the organics. And the idea is, is to remove the food source and the population will drop. Makes sense, perfect sense. Um, and thanks for making that point because that that's great. Yeah, don't do it in your display tank, please guys. Um, and so if, if like when you're, obviously when you're dealing with a customer or helping someone on the phone, it's different than what you can see yourself in person, but is there any reasoning that you would choose one over the other, formalin or freshwater dip, if you're trying to, diagnose using it to if diagnose. i'm trying myself if i'm trying to use it as a diagnostic tool i'm gonna do a fresh water dip okay it's quicker and it, again you know. just to be clear if if he scratches a lot more in the fresh water dip that means he does have a high amount of parasites or or whatever right correct okay and if he sits there and acts like nothing's wrong then we got to go back to square one and figure out what's going on correct <laughs> Yeah, it, if they if they just hang out, and it's funny because a clean seahorse will literally just sit in the tank and just look around like, what the heck did you put me in here for? And it's not a big deal. So um, if they're like that, I know they're clean. And if I'm having a problem, I know I got to look elsewhere. Yep. And and again, guys, I'm, I'm just warning you, if you do use this, they if they do have para, parasitical issue, they're going to flip and, and go nuts. And it's scary to the human but the seahorse is, is gonna feel so much better when it's over. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, I, sh I, I should say this though. Yes. When you're doing a freshwater dip, a lot of times it takes 24 hours for the seahorse to recover, especially if, they're, if they have a high load inside the oral cavity or in the gills. Now, quite often, as I mentioned in the thing we do for weak snick, with weak snick, once we do the freshwater dip, I wanna wait 24 hours before I evaluate the seahorse if he needs further treatment. And most of the time, I'm gonna go ahead and do a long-term formalin bath anyway. But what happens is the process of the dip, the organism's trying to burrow within the flesh. Uh, the seahorse is already sore. They're gonna have increased uh, edema or swelling. And it takes about 24 hours for that to reduce down to see if they can eat. So, you know, I don't, you know, it, the, there's also a certain amount of stress that's placed on the seahorse. So they need to have some time to de-stress and let the swelling go down. Great. And I, I'm trying to not miss these comments in the, or the questions in the comments section. And Chris, Carrie, hi, Chris. If you want to jump in, feel free, but we miss you either way. Hope you're doing well. Um, mentioned he uses both of these methods. And he did mention also that you don't want to siphon the tank by sucking on the siphon while you're treating with formalin. <laughs> good, good point. Um, Pre-prime the siphon first by filling with water to get it started, and the reasoning I think was next you don't want formalin in your mouth, throat, or lungs. And just to I know you covered it in your presentation, Dan, but um, if people are worried that for if people are have seahorses and they notice that the seahorse is scratching, they give you a call or they determine on their own that you know this very likely is a problem and decide to do one of these dips or bath. Um, should if they're worried about the formalin being cancerous um or they're from the reef world and have just been told the whole time no it's terrible which it is in a reef situation i'm getting to it guys anyways is there anything they can like should they wear gloves is this something we should be really careful of or well i do recommend being careful with it i mean you want to wear gloves you know, once it's placed in the tank, the solution is a lot less. But if you spill it while you're handling it, you're getting it directly on your skin. So wearing gloves would make sense. Wearing glasses of safety glasses of some sort would make sense. And keeping your nose away from it would make sense as well. What I can tell you is, is that everybody in the aquaculture world has been using formin. I've been using it for 17 years. Um, 
in many, many different tanks at a time. Um, I should be doing all the safety precautions. I haven't. And, you know, I haven't had any untoward reactions. Now, some people will react to it. But, you know, even as I said before, even in the medical community, you know, they use it on people that have excess sweaty feet. <laughs> they actually take formalin and use it as a topical solution on the feet to stop the sweating and the odors. Which is just uh, crazy. And, and, you know, when people tell me they're freaking out about the formalin, I mean, if you look at hair straightening uh, treatments, I mean, almost all of those have formalin in it. M many, many different cosmetics have it. And they're not always listed because if there's less than 1% in there, they don't have to list it. Or they have agents that create formalin when it's being used. So, you know, and if you buy a new house, you know, a new house is probably going to have a higher content of formalin in the air than what you're going to get in the air from treating your tank. You know, Absolutely. it's used in all of our building products and insulation and furniture and drywall and plywood. And I mean, it's, it's, right. it's, it's out there. And, um, you know, I, I don't blame somebody for not using it. I'm not against somebody not using it, but I can tell you with seahorses, it's an extremely useful tool when you're dealing with parasitic issues. No, I agree. And I was just kind of getting that out there because I came from the reefing world and got when I got into seahorses. And so I had these same thoughts that my reef friends are kind of mentioning. And I thought formalin was so terrible. And that's why we had that wonderful experience of FaceTime when I did my first freshwater dip because I was afraid of the formalin. And then now, you know, I, I still have some stocked up because they stopped selling it. But um, with the formalin, the big fear is that it will become, it will turn into formaldehyde. Is that how you say it? Um, and, and if so, how can you tell? Like, I know that they were selling formalin in the little white bottle where you couldn't see inside. Can you? Right. Go ahead. Formalin should be stored, and I should have covered this. Formalin okay. should, should be stored at room temperature in a dark place. And if it gets cold or if it sits for too long, it can turn into what's called paraformaldehyde. And paraformaldehyde is toxic to the fish where uh, formaldehyde is not. And you can tell it's turned to paraformaldehyde in two ways. One, it's no longer clear. The solution should be clear. And two, if you have crystals forming on the bottom, then it's turning. So uh, I do prefer clear containers um, when I get it. Um, I get it in the big jugs that are not clear, but they're like a milk jug almost. And, um, or I get it in glass bottles. When you buy it online, like f from um, eBay or um, Amazon, they usually come in an amber bottle. And first thing I do when I get it is pour it into a clear jar or glass and inspect it and then put it back in the bottle. Smart, smart. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so D, there are no dumb questions, sir. Um, but I'm, I, I hope I'm reading this right. You said tap, or you said you're going to use tap water for seahorses or um, kind of tell me what that meant. But then you said uh, freshwater dip is RO water only. Is that correct, Dan? RO water only, or can you use tap or what? I use RO water. Uh, my preference is distilled water. Um, but RO water will work just fine if you've got a good working RO machine. There's not a big difference, but some people don't have an RO machine. It's easy for them to pick up a gallon of distilled water. Gotcha. Uh, tap water can be used provided it's been treated so that it doesn't have any um, of the chlorine or chloramines in it. It right. needs to be dechlorinated. Gotcha. But generally speaking, I prefer not to use tap water. I do get customers that that's their only choice. I just have them make sure because um, even if it's got chloramines, if you remove the chlorine, you still got the chloramine is chloramine and ammonia. You still got some of the ammonia residual amounts left. Gotcha. Dylan made a great point. We talk all the time on this channel about, you know, you want to keep, make sure your seahorses don't get stressed out because when they get stressed out, their immune system goes bloop. And, you know, then we have all sorts of troubles. And he and Dylan made the point. So if you get a brand new seahorse right out of the box and shipping, they're going to be stressed. Would you then freshwater dip before adding them to a display or quarantine or, and I think you covered this, but I just wanted to ask it again. If it's coming from a reputable source, yes. then they're going straight um, into a quarantine tank. Uh, I do quarantine seahorses that I get. 
And then if it's coming from an unreputable or one that is doesn't have a high reputation of good, clean seahorses, then they're going straight into the quarantine tank. Um, I have dipped them sometimes in the past from the shipping box to a freshwater dip to a tank. Uh, I had to do that with some imports I had coming out of uh, Sri Lanka. And I had a hundred reed eye that were approximately two and a half inches in size that I freshwater dipped every one of them before I put them in the tank. So they went from the shipping bag to a freshwater dip to the tank. And I normally don't recommend that because it is hard on them. Um, in this case, I didn't lose any, but I did have a lot of reactions and uh, I had a heads up that I was gonna have a problem. Cool. So I did it. And that surprises me um, too, because I know just not to veer off uh, subject too much, but with the quarantining, I know that when I would buy seahorses from you, and obviously you know your seahorses, so it's a little different, but um, you directed me to put them, you know, just uh, temperature acclimate them and add them to the tank. Now, seahorse tanks are typically different, especially in my case, because my tanks are almost like a hospital tank, um, because it, the most I'd have in it is macros. I don't keep coral or other fish. Um, but you have made the point many times before that while we can talk about what we do on this channel and, and help anybody who needs help and educate, you still need to listen to whoever you bought them from, correct? Is that? Yes. Um, and the reason I, I suggest that is uh, theoretically, you're going to be buying from somebody who's reputable and they should already have a very good baseline knowledge. Secondly, you know, myself, if I have, a, if I sell seahorses to a customer and they have an issue and they want me to do a replacement or, you know, back my product up, I want the opportunity to correct any issues. So quite often I have people, you know, that think they already know everything and they go off on their own and they do whatever. And then they call me up 10 days, 15 days later and say, I lost the seahorse. And they tell me why, and they describe it. And I'm like, geez, if you'd only told me this when you had the problem, we could have fixed it. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not fair for the breeder not to have an opportunity to interject a possible scenario for correcting something. Gotcha. And so overall, listen to who you buy them from. Um, you can make a quarantine quite comfortable to a seahorse where they aren't so stressed. Hitches, you know, air, it's basic. Um, but the, you've said it a couple times, I just want to reiterate. So if you're buying from a reputable breeder, maybe observe first, don't just treat this. Is, you can use this as a diagnostic tool, but you don't, it's not something you should just jump into, right? No, I, you should not have to expect to, to do um, freshwater dips or formula treatments on a new arrival from a reputable breeder. You know, if you're collect, buying them from a collector down in the Keys, I probably would. If I was getting seahorses from Alyssa, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be thinking I need to treat them. I would think that they're coming in ready to go. Yeah, I was going to say, out of the many, many seahorses that I've bought from you and Alyssa, I, I only had two that ever had you know issues where I even had to face this. So it's not an all the time thing. But if you see your seahorses okay. using its tail to like almost looks like a dog's, <laughs> I keep making that motion, but it really looks like that. Um, yep. Or, you know, rubbing up against stuff, that's when you call Dan or, you know, use the methods that we've talked about. Jerry Gunn, no worries. Glad you're here. And you said you do five minute freshwater dips. I, I believe they've already said it in the comments, but is it eight to 12 minutes? Is that right, Ray? Yes, eight, eight to 12 minutes for seahorses because of the differences in the anatomy and how long it takes for the freshwater to work. Yep. And Salty said quarantine everything. He believes in observation before medication treatment. I hear you, yes. dude. But I, we just, we really wanted to talk about this to, to let people who are interested in keeping seahorses or might have seahorses and have a problem understand that this isn't as scary as it seems. And the first time it was scary, but go ahead. Yeah, I don't want it to sound like every seahorse needs to be freshwater right. dipped or formalin treatment. That's not the case. But mm -hmm. people who encounter weak snick, people that have, you know, people that are going to breed seahorses and want to raise fry, they're going to have to figure out something if they're not going to be willing to do freshwater dips or uh, formalin treatments. Um, and I also want to mention that if anybody goes into the group under the file section, there is an article on how to give a seahorse a freshwater dip. And it's detailed enough that you can print that out and follow the directions on that and do it very easily. 
-hmm. So the file section, there's a PDF on it, and it's basically the material I covered in doing the freshwater dip. Awesome. And I will link to directly to the group's files um, when we're done. Um, and let's see, Jerry, we talked a little bit about this, but no worries. You looked at your bottle and there's some white sediment in the bottom. Um, is there any way to like, if you, if, if there's even a question that it's turning, do you, do you ditch it, Dan, or, or I toss it. toss it. Okay. I toss it too, too, too much. Now the, th the trick, well, the trick here is the problem that occurs is that getting formalin in the winter months is problematic because people that live in Northern climates, they ship it. The bottle's going to get cold. Once it gets below about 45, 40 degrees, mm -hmm. it's going to start turning to paraformaldehyde. Yes. So um, what a couple of the aquaculture companies I buy formalin from, I have to make sure I buy it during the warm months because they won't ship it during the winter months. Gotcha. Mermaid's Reef said so one could stick their feet in with the seahorses. Honey, um, I'm, I'm hoping you don't have stinky feet, okay? But uh, let's see. Okay, and D, uh, you don't think it's bad, you just can't get it anywhere. Is it still, we can try to link it when we're done. Is it still available on Amazon and eBay? I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, every time somebody asks me, I go on and find it for them. Um, gotcha, cool. But I'll take a quick look-see. I see Sam just joined. I'm trying to jump through these questions and then I want to give you plenty of time to talk. Welcome, Sam. Dylan said, so you can freshwater dip macroalgae. I've seen many people on the internet say no to this. Could you dip them in coral dip? Okay, so with macros, I don't mean to be like not answering you directly, but it really does depend on the species. Um, some macros can totally handle almost anything, and some are really, you know, gonna gonna fall apart and go to heck, if, you know, any kind of changes or any kind of dips. So feel free to message me on the side, or if you have a specific species you want to ask about, um, I can definitely let you know, but there's just no hard, fast rule. I can tell you what's worked for me. Um, with macros, I, I tend to try to steer clear of using anything on them because I have lost, like uh, the beautiful Halaminia rose petal that I got from Krista, I ended up losing because of one of these situations um, where I was trying to get something off of it and it didn't go well. So. Yeah, depends on the species. Okay, D said, do you treat all seahorses with it? We, I think we, we got that. Um, reef tanks, uh, reef sea, seahorses seem complicated, guys, but we're just trying to cover everything on these Wine Wednesdays. You, I could, you would not believe how many people have kept seahorses and had no troubles. And none of this. This is just for the people who need it, and just to let you know that the resources are there. Um, Okay, well, I try to scroll through any of the, the rest of the comments. Oh, Dan's showing us. Okay, cool. There you go. And yep, that's on Amazon. That was just typing in the keyword. It came right up. So it's 37% formaldehyde. That's a one liter bottle. Um, and if you look at it closely, it's the exact same thing that I just showed on the presentation. But it's uh, you can also find it on eBay much the same way. Now, the other thing to remember is, is that if you buy smaller quantities, they can ship it to you, uh, no problem. If you buy gallons or more, it's going to go hazmat. So um, most people don't need very much. Typically, you know, even even 250 mLs will last most people plenty. Gotcha. And um, I saw we're talking about Xenia. I see. <laughs> I'm going. I'm with Salty. I like the the thought of a diluted peroxide solution dip. Um, just because the two, Xenia and Alva, are both oh, those is. kind of delicate ones. All right, Sam, how are you? Australian formula. Oh, here, uh, let, me, let me make you big. Hang on. Let me get over here. It's a, There you go. Just an Australian one from uh, LFS. Most have them. So, you know, not hard to get at all. Oh, but, my yeah. just, And what's uh, it? It's just... Uh, it's just uh, yeah, thirty-seven percent for malder, for maldehyde, yeah, general formula that you want to use. So it's same as what Dan's put up, basically. But yep. And just a slightly different brand. Yep. And um, is it easier to get over there? Yeah, all um, most LFSs have them. And particularly any that are uh, fresh water that specialize in discus breeding, they're the ones you'll get most medications at. So, yep, no problems at all getting that one. Well, lucky you, because it is hard to get over here for sure. So, Sam, um, we saw in the comment section, Chris was uh, um, 
someone who uses both of these methods. What about you? Obviously, you use, you use the formula, <laughs> or formalin, sorry. But uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and I did freshwater dips too as a, um, a diagnosis tool. And in aquaculture, formulin use is very common. Absolutely. You been doing okay on the side? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good. I've got my new little friend here. Here he is. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I saw a photo of him. I'm sorry, I'm trying to jump yeah. back and forth to make you big. Sorry. That's yeah. my 15 week old baby. <laughs> Love it. I him earlier and turned him into a total soaking wet blob. <laughs> oh, he was in the shower with me. We went for a walk and um, I find the easiest way to give him a shower at the moment is just to jump in myself with my clothes on, and he loves it, loves oh, it, loves sure. it. <laughs> it's, so funny. it's funny teaching a baby new things. Yes, and that's awesome. just sure. learning how to fly. Yeah, so it's quite fun. I think it's awesome. I'm I'm jealous. I, I want I want a cool pet. Darn it. Well, I guess I have seahorses. What am I talking about? But still, love it. <laughs> Uh, okay, guys, so Dan kind of talked about this a little bit before, but uh, Sam or anyone, um, when you do see that a seahorse is flicking or having troubles and you do a freshwater dip or go straight to the formalin, um, first of all, Sam, do you have any preference or what makes you decide to do one or the other? I asked Dan earlier, but what do you think? It uh, depends on where the seahorse itself has come from, whether it's um, captive bred, wild caught, etc. And I will, if I um, really think I've got a parasite issue, I'll just go straight to the formula and dip rather than fresh water because it really doesn't have any negative effects at all that I'm aware of. Hey, uh, I have one more question after this, but speaking of which, am I remembering incorrectly, um, and this can go to Dan or anybody who wants to answer, um, I, I, something's hitting my brain making me think that the only thing that can go wrong with a fresh water dip is if it's actually a bacterial problem and they have a wound. Is that, am I making that up? Or no, sure? that's, okay. you do not want to put a seahorse with an open wound into a fresh water dip. Yeah, absolutely. They've got no osmosis regulation, really bad for them. Um, in that case, you would do a formalin um, long-term bath is what I would probably do instead. Formalin is a very mild anti antiseptic. Um, it's not something I would use as a purposeful purpose of treating infections, but it does have some uh, properties for killing bacteria. Okay, and my final question, guys, is um, you, we, we touched on it briefly, but um, if you have a seahorse that you've noticed is flicking and the rest of the seahorses in the tank seem fine, and you do a freshwater dip to see what's going on with that seahorse and it goes ape crazy, <laughs> I can't start to say something else, ape crazy, um, and you know that uh, he does, ha he's having some problems here, how do you weigh, Dan, you said I would typically just go ahead and do, treat the rest. Um, but is there any like criteria that do you wait and see if they scratch or do you just do it? Um, my thought process, if one seahorse needs treatment for uh, parasites, I recommend going ahead and treating them all because the others mm -hmm. probably have them and are asymptomatic and don't have quite the load. And, you know, the formalin treatment is actually a very mild treatment. And, you know, if you don't do it, then what you're probably going <laughs> to find down the road is that you're going to be treating each one individually. Right. And weak snick um, is something that's very easy to treat early on. We're very successful. It can be very difficult late stage. So okay. it's better to go ahead and, and do it in my eyes. You know, I don't think we even mentioned that. So you treat weak snick with formalin too. Well, normally my proceed, I got an article on weak snick too, but yep. usually what I do is a freshwater dip to, uh, to help diagnose what's going on. And then I follow it up with a long-term formalin treatment. And if that doesn't work, I follow that up with a formalin dip and then go back to a long-term formalin treatment. And uh, if it's parasitic in nature, that normally takes care of it. Wicksnick is no most commonly a parasitic issue. 
um, there was an article on Pew's Jaw where a vet was saying oh, that in right. public aquariums Hello? that, that uh, it's usually from um, a atrophy of the muscles from poor foods, but in the hobby community, uh, it's most mm. commonly parasitic. Right. And, and we've talked a lot. Everybody's mentioned that, you know, a lot depends on where you're buying your seahorses. If you're buying from a reputable breeder, can't get it out, you're probably fine. But I mean, it, like in my case, uh, when I had to give my seahorse a freshwater dip and it did end up going crazy, um, it was a long time after I'd had the seahorses. So I know I'm repeating stuff you've already said, but I just want to make sure anybody who comes in late gets it that, you know, it, you have ciliates in your tank. It, when the organics get get to get a going, then they can have a problem that didn't come from the purchase, correct? Yes, it can happen. Uh, it's usually not a quick acting thing with larger seahorses. It takes time to develop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I commonly see in most cases where there's weak snick, for example, or parasitic mm -hmm. issues with captive mm -hmm. bred seahorses, it's from poor filtration. Right. And, you know, I think I mentioned, I think it was last week, last week, and I think I mentioned it in the forum or the group as well. Um, when people don't use a protein skimmer and they don't use any mechanical filtration and they try to set it up where everything naturally breaks down somewhere between six to nine months, usually more commonly at nine to 12 months, we start seeing issues, whether it's weak SNCC or pouch emphysema or things like that. And, you know, filtration is the key to the prevention of uh, the most common parasites we're going to see with seahorses are going to be ciliates. Mm -hmm. uh, things like nematodes and stuff like that have multiple life cycles. You don't normally see that with seahorses. In extreme cases, you can end up with gill flukes. And of course, if you have other tank mates, it's possible for seahorses to get ick. It won't be visible. It'll be in the gills. Um, and there's a couple of other things that can happen, but ciliates are by far the most common thing. And uh, I know I keep saying last question, but did, did it, for any of you, and Marina, hello, welcome. I want to give you a chance to speak if you'd like to. Sorry, I keep rambling. Um, but it, the thing that I always worried about, and we've talked a little bit, is putting the seahorses back in the tank. So do you, I know you went through it, but do you suggest maybe how long should someone keep them in quarantine after? Um, treating them? I mean, can you like outweight the, the tanks? Or? Well, would it be more clean the tank rather than quarantine? Like you've treated your seahorses, wouldn't you sterilize the tank? No, not necessarily. Um, the way that I normally do it, first of all, if they're going to do a formalin treatment, that's six days right there. So after they've, they're done doing the formalin treatment, we want to wait a few days anyway to make sure that we do have the problem cleared up. So I'll wait. Um, I like to go about two weeks before I put the seahorses back in the tank if I think the tank is a problem. And during that time frame, we're, we're scrubbing the tank, we're doing water changes. And then usually what I do during that wait period is have them dose the tank daily at one to two parts per million with peroxide. Uh, so you're cleaning the tank really well anyway. So yes, yes. yes. Yeah, making sure it's clean before putting those horses back in. Yep. And every time you do water changes, you are, you know, making things better. So maybe water changes, right? Um, okay, Jerry, or Jerry asked, how do you dispose of formalin? That's Jerry. a great question. Uh, I actually take it to the chemical, um, uh, re, uh, the chemical waste disposal of your local council area. There's one for all farm chemicals, things under your sink, ammonia, stuff like that, even uh, cooking oil. Uh, should never go down the drain, should always go to a chemical um, place like that. They, they exist everywhere in Australia, and I know they exist in America too. So, um, I haven't had to dispose of it very often, but normally I dump it into a large amount of wastewater that goes outside to evaporate. And formalin, being formaldehyde, um, once it's dumped outside, it's going as it dries, it's going to turn into a gas and go into the atmosphere. Absolutely, and guys, um, I will go through this after we're done and and uh, link 
the notes from the group and etc. So, but if you have any questions afterwards and, and or missed it, re-ask or ask in the you know comments afterwards. I, I do check them later. And I'm totally with you, Salty. I absolutely love macros with Xenia and seahorses. Beautiful, flowy, oh, gorgeous. Love it. Okay, I'm trying to see I have if a I quick question. Yes, ma'am. Go. May have mentioned this already, but. If you're storing formalin properly, what is the approximate shelf life before you should replace it? Um, I don't know that there is a specific shelf life. Um, I've never paid attention to it that way. The way that I've done it is I've inspected it to make sure that it's still clear and no crystals. As long as it's clear and no crystals and kept in a sealed container, I use it. Uh, I've had it for up to a year and still used it still with you know effectiveness. I was going to say, I think my, mine had an expiration date. The I've shelf had, life um, probably depends a lot on the actual ambient temperature that it's kept in. In the tropics where it's getting hot, it's going to, uh, to uh, start to come out of solution a lot quicker than what it will somewhere where it's really cold. Well, the other so, trick to it is, is how much methanol is in there. If it's got 15% methanol, it will usually withstand that without a problem. Yeah, that will make a big difference to the temperature controllability. Yep, definitely. Hey, Holly, um, I, I, if there was any other questions about Fry, please feel free. Um, but I also wanted, wondered, you started using formalin and it made a big difference for you with your Fry, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it did right away. Gotcha. And Dan mentioned I, how I've had often. a bottle of formalin now for going on six years. I'm sorry, Cheryl, what would you say? I missed it. I, I, I just don't use that much of it. I do have a question for Dan in regards to fry. What? Um, I agree with you because when I'm raising combs fry, I typically, they, they may be a month old or even longer before I even see any scratching on them as, a, as opposed to a rectus, which seems if they're going to start scratching, they seem to do it very early on. And I'm yes. just curious right. as to why that would be. I don't know. And I will say this, I've observed something very similar with my pelagic fry. I usually don't see scratching until a couple of weeks. And I don't know if it's because of a different food source. I don't know if it's just something inherently different between the species, but, um, I know with the rectus fry, if we use formalin on day one and follow all of our procedures, I expect somewhere close to a 90% or higher survival rate. Wow. Um, so, you know, that's the difference that it makes with what we do and how we do it. Yeah, I just, it seems kind of odd because you'd think that they would both be the, they would all be the same, but they're definitely not. And it, may, maybe some of the pelagic species are more resistant. It, it, food may be a major portion too. That's a good point especially if you're feeding pods versus baby brine shrimp. Well, you know, I'm using, um, with pelagic fry, I was using collected plankton, which was wild caught plankton. Um, the big concern I had with the plankton was less with parasitic issues, more with uh, hydroids. So mm -hmm. I would prophylactically treat for hydroids and they handled that just fine. But my experience has been with pelagic fry, if I do a lot of... Um, if I do formally with them, they usually don't do well the first two weeks. Well, I've, I've, even with my erectus, uh, the last few broods that I raised, I first time I added any form for them, they were over a month old and a couple, a couple of them started scratching just a hair. And it, I'm not sure if it's my filtration or what, but I'm just not using it the way I used to when I first started. Well, I'm, I bet you do have you know, you, you get better as you go. So I can totally see yeah. that. I, um, I think it's the type of type of nursery systems that yeah. are making the difference. Absolutely. And hey, Lucy, so glad you could jump in. Guys, I'm not crazy. I keep banging on the wall because my, I've got twin 13 year olds. That's all, I mean, that, that's it. <laughs> um, and Miss Marina, hello. If you, um, we love when you join, but I just wanted to make sure if you, had a question or wanted to share anything or are you just jumping in to hang? Just jumping in to hang and, awesome. and listen and learn. Uh, hey. Hi, Kelly. 
we put all the participants on screen. What, what was it, Sam? Can we have everyone on screen? Yeah, everybody's on screen. Oh, I can only see Dan and myself down in the corner. Oh, you got to change it. Um, are you on the phone? No, I'm on my iPad and I have changed it. Uh, oh, hang on, how do I do it? You need to change the view to gallery view. Yes. I've done that. Hey, Lucy, while she's fixing that, um, scroll up a few comments. Dylan's asking about uh, how do you, how would you dip Xenia and or Alva or other macros? So I, I'm curious to see how you handle that because I have always, I've experimented with it and some macro species and coral do really well, some do not. So I'm always kind of leery of making a grand statement. What, what do you do? Hey, Ray, thanks for coming. Sorry, we're, we're yapping so long. Anything you want to add? Oh, he's gone. Okay, <laughs> guess not. <laughs> Night though. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Lucy, let's let's hear your thoughts on that. Scroll up a few comments. And uh, I think Dylan asked, you don't dip macros. They they always die on you. See, so it's kind of iffy. What about um, what Salty Salty um, actually recommended a um, peroxide a diluted peroxide dip? What, how do you feel about that with macros? Have you ever tried that? Just curious. Um, and yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure we covered that stuff. Anything else, guys? Isn't peroxide a treatment for algae? Yes, it's used sometimes as an algae side or a fungi side. It Ooh. kills fungus, funguses, oh, yeah. mold, and stuff. Yeah, it's probably not what I'd use on macro you actually want. I don't know. If you do a quick dip, I can tell you that uh, they use. Uh, one of the things I was reading about when I was studying peroxide is it's used a lot on uh, land uh, plants for killing mold and stuff. So, you know, I don't know how well, I know formalin is real bad for, for uh, macros, but I don't know how, if you look at the uh, freshwater aquarium world, some of the guys in their planted tanks will use peroxide as a treatment for killing off, uh, you know, some of your nuisance algae. And I have, I've used fresh water quite a few times if I was extremely worried about the source, that, like if I knew that the, the macros were coming, you know, from specific places or directly, you know, like you could always go to Algae Barn. They have clean macros, they're really good. Um, and they sponsor this channel, so hey! <laughs> or they sponsor us when we do events, I should say. Um, but yeah, great points, you guys. Thanks for correcting me. What'd you say, Sam? If you're in America. <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I got to give it to you later. Um, and Jerry Gunn asked, what does anyone know about prolapsed pouch on dwarfs? I know nothing. Same so, Dan, go it's for the it. Same th it's the same thing as a bigger species. There's not much you can do. Now, I do know of people who have tried to put prolap prolapsed pouches back in. I don't recommend it because of the potential for injury. A prolapse pouch is basically some of the epithelial tissue is hanging out of the pouch. It's very unsightly, but generally speaking, most seahorses, they can go the whole life with it without a problem. And in many cases, you'll have males that will have it. And once they get pregnant again, it goes back in. Um, if it stays out too long, then it becomes a permanent thing and they end up not being a good choice for a breeder. Is it actually... Um, uh effective thing to push the uh, back in Dan? I don't recommend it. I know it's been done successfully, but I also know people who've done it and their seahorse was never able to breed afterwards. So, uh, um, you know, you're talking about some very, very um, delicate tissue and I generally let it be. Um, yep. As far as a display animal goes, you know, it's not going to hurt the animal, um, but, you know, it is a little bit unsightly for some people. Jerry said that half of his males had prolapsed pouches straight from the dealer. Wow. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. That's got to be a real um, defect of some sort. Do we know I what causes it? Or? Well, it can happen from a number of things. It can happen from them flushing too hard. It can happen after a pregnancy and when they're pushing out. Um, I don't know if that is a genetic type thing that can be transferred or not um you know as far as having the propensity for it to occur 
So, Does water quality have an effect for such a big batch to have it like that? I wouldn't expect so unless they were, you know, excessively flushing their pouches because of the water quality, but I, that's generally not an issue. You know, usually the pouch flushing is to prep ahead of time for taking a pregnancy and to sometimes impress sure. the females. Yeah. Molly, Molly, yeah. Jerry said he tried to push it back in. It didn't work. He cut it off with surgical scissors, scissors and then H2O2 dip, and they're all still alive two years later. Wow. First of all, that took guts, and second of all, congrats. My goodness. I mean, what's the dwarf lifeline anyways, or lifespan, sorry. Well, yeah, it can be anywhere from two to three years as a oh. rule. Um, the the thing about cutting the pouch off, you could equate that to the equivalency of cutting part of the uterus out. Oh, it's not really like a tubal ligation. It is like a, a hysterectomy. It's wild. Mm. Yeah. Well, mo most of the pouch problems with pouch prolapses that I've seen, the males can't, well, the pouch, the epithelial will actually go back inside during the pregnancy, and then you'll see the pouch prolapse again after they deliver. And the, um, this is just from other people. I've only seen one prolapse pouch in 15 years, so I'm not the best person to talk to, but just from talking with other people. I've yeah. seen it many many times. I've never seen it to be a genetic issue. Mm. Um, I'm not saying it's not, and it, I'm not saying it can't happen, but I've never seen it to be. And generally speaking, with dwarf seahorses, I mean, I've had up to you know several hundred at a time for over a period of several years, and it was very rare to see a prolapse pouch on dwarfs. It was more common in the larger seahorses, mm. uh, especially the ones that were overactive and pumping out their, you know, pumping the, the water through their pouches. Gotcha. Sorry, I keep trying to read comments and keep up with the screen and the comments. So sorry. Um, what it, usually when I see it appear, it seems my nitrate, are you talking about the Alva? I'm, I'm guessing. And what he was talking about clean macros um, is usually like algae barn actually grows them in house and, you know, make sure that they're completely pest free. They, I, I don't know about their guarantee, but they, I've never heard anyone complain about those. And Cheryl and I have talked um, before, um, and uh, yeah, feel free, Cheryl, but quarantining, the only thing I would say when you're quarantining macros is make sure you provide light, because they need it, and make sure that you provide um, some sort of um, food or, you know, something to make the little aptaceous come out. What do you do about quarantine, Cheryl? Macros. Well, I, I, as you know, if it's macro, I've seen too many problems early on where you put something in a tank and a few weeks later or a few months later, you suddenly you have Aptasia or who knows what else or Asterina stars. And basically, if it's macro, I don't care where it comes from, it's going into a quarantine tank for six months. And that's after I freshwater dip it and coral dip it before it goes into the quarantine. Because some of the stuff can really survive for long periods of time, and you won't even notice there. Uh, bristle worms are another one. Mm -hmm. It's easier prevention is easier than the cure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what dip do you use, Cheryl? What coral dip do you use? Okay, I'm sorry. What I didn't coral know. dip do you use, Cheryl? Do you use Bayer or uh, uh, Coral Revive, or which dip do you like? Uh, I usually use the Coral RX that we get here. It works pretty well. If I'm actually using corals, I'm actually going to use an insecticide that uh, all my oh, real plants use. Um, yeah, that, yeah. That's completely different. Yeah, that's fairly common here for people to use Bayer, which is a garden insecticide for corals. They do here too. Yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. I have a bottle around here somewhere. The insecticide doesn't get used very often. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, and I'll just say again, though, too, that uh, with with macros, I'm, you know, Lucy's right. If you if you go to try to do anything or soft corals too, it kind of I I had problems with that too. Um, you know, you got to be willing to understand that you know they might not like it too much or make it through. Um, whereas if you quarantine something, if you do it for long enough and you provide a food source, then, you know, 
I don't know. It's 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 got to be what you decide. You got to weigh your pros and cons. But and uh, Kelly Kelly had some is the had is the word. I love tough jointed macroalgae. That is one of my favorite species, and I do not have any anymore. I had it for a very long time, but I don't now. And if I find some, I will let you know for sure. Who was talking? Sorry. Yeah. The the thing with any of this stuff is ultimately prevention is a lot easier than trying to eradicate something that's already contaminated in the tank. And then you're faced with trying to find, whether it be shrimp or whatever that will eat it. Now that's gonna starve once they eat the population. And it just, it's much easier just to start out sterile. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. And Dylan, <laughs> uh, I actually got it from within a women's uh, frag swapping group. <laughs> so, um, I will definitely look around for you, and if I can find some, I will let you know, um, and I'll check all my sources for you, I promise. But. I have one tank with macro. I've owned that macro for over six years. Wow, that's awesome. I miss, I, I miss my macro tank. It was so awesome. I, I lost so many when I moved everything over to a much bigger tank just because I didn't I just made mistakes in the move, um, and uh, but yeah, I, I miss all. I had I had the most macrofied tank of anybody. It had every well, maybe not Lucy. Lucy's probably got me beat. But anyways, sorry, way <laughs> off topic. Uh, any other questions or thoughts, questions, anything, Dan, that you've thought of that we didn't get to say, or anybody have any other questions about formalin freshwater dips? I think I covered all of mine. I had oh, or, a question for Dan. Go ahead. Uh, when you see the, the uh, what I call trigger breathing, where every respiration, the trigger is coming down. And, and oftentimes they leave their the snout open, the trigger stuck back, and they look like they're coughing. Are you asking whether or not to do a dip? I'm assuming that that would need a dip. Well, a dip would tell you if parasites are the, the question. The cause. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I've seen that, uh, I've seen uh, videos of that from other people, and it, the, um, the seahorses typically do not do real well. Yeah, um, I would probably do a dip just as a uh, diagnostic tool, just to see if they react. And what, what you're describing is weak snick, right, or symptom? No. no. Oh. Well, it may be a pre-thing to weak snick, but... You know, parasites can get into the oral cavity and create problems without be, having weak SNCC itself. You know, there's there's a, the, the snicking action that happens in a seahorse is a very complicated action. There's papers written on it with all the different things that occur for it to happen in a fraction of a second. And um, you can have a stuck trigger without having weak SNCC. Um, now, you, as she said, you know, there's problems that are going to follow afterwards, but um, it's entirely possible to have a parasitic load and not have sweet, uh, weak snick. Gotcha. Well, very quickly, yeah. can you just say, uh, can, can I, for anybody who's watching that doesn't know what weak snick is, is there, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Weak snick is when a seahorse tries to snick the food and instead of slurping it up and macerating it through their, their oral cavity and swallowing it, they get it to the mouth, but they have a hard time getting it in. Now, we're not talking about a large piece of, of food, but just a normal size thing that they normally snick. If you watch a seahorse eat, when they snick, that action occurs, that food disappears right into the snout. And within seconds, you see what looks like a smoke cloud coming out of their gills. Well, that's a healthy sign of a good snick. When a weak snick, they have a hard time getting it in. And most commonly, you won't see that big cloud come out of the back of their gills because they're having a tough time pulling it through and macerating it properly before it goes to the gut. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, yeah. the, re the thing is with the stuck trigger too is it can also be caused by mechanical injury from, yes. from my, my understanding. And weak snick can be caused by mechanical injury yes. as well. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry guys, I forgot I forgot to turn my camera back on. Here I am. Um, but yeah, I'm looking through. I think you covered every single one of my questions. Um, so does anybody have anything else that they wanted to share or talk about or anything? Somebody want to come and clean my tanks tonight? 
Sure, right after I clean mine. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, I could do it that but I show sure why not. <laughs> okay. Tomorrow's my day, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how many tanks I have. <laughs> right, the, the, that's my house is like a revolving right, I hear you. Um, so topic next week, any thoughts, anybody? Let's ask the audience what they would like for a topic next week. That's a great suggestion. Anyone in the audience, what shall we talk about next week? <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry, we're trying to read these again. Jerry, I still can't get over the fact that you were able to do surgery on dwarf seahorses, those little teeny guys. The reason I couldn't help at all is because I've never kept them. Um, but, okay, flow. Dylan's still saying flow. And I know that's one on the list for sure. Before I get... I too maybe since we just talked about um parasites maybe bacterial stuff next week yeah. we kind of we we've kind of covered that again but we're going to recover topics so absolutely um that, up for a vote guys another one would be hydroids um we've mm -hmm. talked about it here and there but we've never really talked about you know what they are the dangers mm -hmm. how to treat blah 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 right it's true What's its name again, Sam? Uh, Ripper. Ripper? Ripper. 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 Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Little Ripper. Gotcha. It's, a stra it's an Aussie term, you Ripper, or Little Ripper. So R-I-P-P-E-R, -P -P -E and Ripper of Fingers, or Toys, <laughs> you know, just depending. <laughs> Love it. I, um, sorry, I was trying to type in any, uh, I can't even think, guys. It's, uh, I'm By the way, her bird is a boy. Oh. Yes, yeah, he he's a male. He's a boy. Him. Yes, he's a boy. He's got green feathers instead of red feathers. Yeah, the, the girls are red and blue. His underwings are, are red, though, so, and his flight feathers and tail feathers are blue so when he flies he looks um, stretches out his wings he looks absolutely stunning the thread. i think that's so cool that you knew that cheryl <laughs> i always forget that you 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 worked with birds and, and studied them didn't you or i used to uh we used to operate an aviary years ago that's right you've just done it all you're so awesome <laughs> okay and um Dylan uh, and Mermaid's Reef. Oh no, Merm Mermaid's Reef is just ready to get her seahorses. I don't. I'm right there with you. Um, yeah, not that feeling. Uh, a couple other people asked for the topic: different breeds and their care. And bye, Dylan. Thanks for coming in. And guys, I'm I'm game for anything suggested. Or Dan, did you have another thought? Or well, there's many different things. You know, uh, Dylan said about different. You know. Uh, different breeds or somebody else on one of the other streams said different breeds in their care. The care is basically the same. The only real difference between the breeds is going to be whether you have tropical or temperate species. Um, but even then, the only difference there really is the temperature. Um, there's all kinds of different things that we can talk about. We can talk about the hydroids. We can talk about... Uh, We've talked about nutrition before. That's been a, a big topic. Um, I I have no problem with, with redoing it. We get new people in, yeah, you know. We could talk about the air bubbles and fry. Uh, we've talked about temperatures before. Flow, what's too high, what's too low. You know uh, what? And, and, and fry, the different breeds um, uh, do matter when you're talking about fry, right? I mean, like, really. It does. Yeah. So, um, we could talk about I'm water I'm particularly fading them. Uh, colors in seahorses and that type of stuff. Uh, we've talked about Very feeding effective. before, how often we feed. Uh, we could talk about uh, what to set the up for a hospital tank, I mean, a, well. a medicine chest. Um, Ooh, good one. We've talked about tank mates before, um, backups. Um, Miss Lucy to said, handle pregnant males, air, um, how to keep the tank cool this time of year, it's how to keep the tank warm. Um, yeah, no, there's the lots. Seahorse? There's lots. We just uh, got to narrow it down. Lucy said behaviors. And Marina, did you say did you say something, or was that did I mistake? Did you have a topic request? Uh, no, I didn't. But I think um, 
it could be cool to like do something about how to choose what seahorse to keep, like picking the right species for you. Not that their care is that different though, like Dan said. But no, I get your point. Kind of like, I, really, thing, yeah. sorry. I really love Barbori, um, but if, if, you know, if you're looking for a really active, t I mean, they're active. I don't know. I, I always compared my Barbori to like um, uh, snooty old people <laughs> because they're just, it, their behaviors. <laughs> they're, not all, they're not all like that though. I had Barbori too and a couple were really standoffish and then a couple were just like the others. So, but they, they were mixed tank as well. So not species only tanks so i don't know if that made a difference or not one thing i would really love to see one of these days is people sharing their different um tips and tricks mm. for like techniques they use um tools they use you know you know stuff that might be little known that would Just be interesting what works for yeah. you i really like that like yeah. the seahorse hack episode yeah. Another one that I would like to see, not necessarily next week, uh, we see a lot of people that have pests, whether it be different types of starfish, flatworms, eptasias, things like this, and they don't, they don't realize the kind of harm that they can do to seahorses, and it oh, might be very just the fact that to so many people think. Bristle worms aren't a pest. Oh, they're benign and all they do is clean the tank and oh God, I hate hearing that. <laughs> There's so many different species of bristle worms. They do eat soft corals. They do eat small sleeping fishes. And you know, like it's, I don't know. I think that's the difference between America and Australia. They see bristle, and sorry, not calling you guys Americans, but even though you are, but in America, a bristle worm or an acerina is seen in a tank and it's like oh life and in australia we see them go oh you're gonna get out of there like you know that's not what but, i want you that's know what in america it's, so it's actually it, i'm sorry it's actually um reef versus like seahorse or freshwater or whatever um because I've oh no even in a reef tank, they will eat your corals. I know. They'll eat your acorns and things like that. They'll steal the food out of them. They'll irritate them and they'll eat your mandarin fish. So it's actually not, a, a, I've seen a really bad infestation. It was an American show on a um, mixed reef tank. Uh, that wasn't a seahorse tank where he'd lost a heap of uh, soft corals and he didn't actually believe that bristle worms were ever a problem either until he saw it for himself so it's actually not just a seahorse tank issue it's just a bristle worm nature thing. no you're you're right and and i like i do like that topic too cheryl because you know we've mentioned um you know the issues that come from the stars uh but we haven't really dove really deep into it so great suggestion marina I, you're, you're so quiet were you trying to say something I was just agreeing with Sam, bristle worms are the devil. <laughs> well, yeah, the thing is, I, I keep seeing pictures or videos of people's tanks on Facebook, and I see Asterina stars, I see bristle worms, I see Aptasia, I see different types of NIMS in their tanks, and th the list goes on. And I, a lot of these people do. don't understand until they lose, start losing seahorses, that they have a problem in the tank with another member in the tank. Right. No, I agree and with you. Okay, well. I wonder what else is in there as well. You know, well, people are very cautious about what they actually allow you to see. Yeah. So, you know, what's in the other corner of the tank is, you know, often what I wonder. Absolutely. But I've got a suspicious mind, so, you know. I, I, I might just be. Well, the, I, hard, the hard part with some of these pest things is, is that you, the, the the reply you hear from people when you tell them, look, that's probably not a good thing to have in your tank is, well, it's been in there for two years. It's not, a, haven't been a problem so far, but then they call you up because they got a bacterial infection from a sting, you know? Yeah. It, um, yeah. It's That's like the anemone and clownfish that, oh, they're friendly until they're not. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, but for next week, I really like the idea of tips and hacks. 
I do too, and we'll, we'll take a quick vote, but I wanted to throw this out there too so I can remember because I rewatch these and take notes. Um, but I, the, the last suggestion I have is at some point, you guys know we're going to cover Artemia. At some point, I'd like to do um, like bring your favorite seahorse tank picture, etc. in whether you want to actually show it and come into the Zoom and, and actually show it on the video or if you want to you know, give, send them to me and I can post them and just show some, because we, we do this channel to hang out on Wednesdays. We educate, um, we share things, but I don't ever want people to think that this, like a lot of my reef friends who want to do seahorses come in and they're like, oh my gosh, this sounds so complicated. And oh my gosh, you mean they have all these problems and we're just covering everything. Yeah, as I said before, there's so much good that, and people, some people never see these problems. So um, don't be tell, discouraged. Just tell them to get another Neptune Apex. <laughs> 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 okay, so up for vote, guys, real quick. Um, oh, hang on, what did Mermaid 3 say? Oh, your three-year-old son got attached to the bristle worms. Oh, yes, he wanted to buy a tank for him. You know what? I, I have a uh, girlfriend named Kylie. Kylie, if you ever see this, I love you, miss you. But uh, she, uh -huh. it, what, didn't she have a fireworm? She Fireworms, right? Yeah, a fireworm or a bobbit worm? Yes, bobbit worms, that's it. <laughs> and, yep. She's also yeah, a tarantula she, chick, so, you know, she's just yeah, awesome. My husband is the yeah, same yeah. way. He keeps my past. <laughs> I mean, he to each their own. For the past, I pull out. <laughs> to each their own. I don't, I, if you want to take worms. I want to kill them and he wants to keep them. Uh, <laughs> then he gets a little side tank, darn it. But yeah, Yay. far away from mine. All right, guys. So jar, some rocks, some water, and that bristle worm will live happily for you. <laughs> right. They are easier <laughs> to care for. Okay, guys. So a yay for tips and hacks and tricks next week. I really like that. Everybody yeah. game? Yes. Okay, yeah. that's it for next week. Thank you. Okay, everybody, if there's anything else. Anybody, anything else? Okay, no. Hey, Lucy, if you can't come in because your internet, get with me before next week. So, you know, I, I'll upload your pictures, show them on screen or whatever, or post them on, on the page so we can see your tips and tricks because you're, you're the master of many of these things. All right, guys. Everybody say good night. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Happy one night. <laughs> Happy Wine Wednesday, everybody. Cheers.